This week on The Experiment, a conversation with Navajo geneticist Renee Begay. It's about the future generation. Who hope to use genetic science to help her own people. We're more complex than just our blood. Listen to The Experiment wherever you get podcasts. Listener supported. WNYC Studios. Brian Lehrer on WNYC, and all this week during our Fall Pledge Drive, we're hearing from some of our favorite professional advice givers on thorny topics like relationships, finances, and etiquette. Last week, we took questions for Cheryl Strayed about the creative process and podcast host Jamila Lemieux about parenting. And joining me now to give advice on personal finance in this crazy financial world that we're living in right now is Michelle Singletary, personal finance columnist for The Washington Post and author of the new book, What to Do With Your Money When Crisis Hits. Michelle, always great to have you on the show. Welcome back to WNYC. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And listeners, do you have a personal finance question for Michelle Singletary, maybe on pandemic era specific investing or saving advice? Or if you're hoping to start investing, investing but don't know where to start or you want to start investing in businesses that align with your ethics, uh, whatever the question is, 646-435-7280, 646 646- 435-7280. And as your questions are coming in, we'll touch on some things that Michelle has been writing about recently. Uh, one of your article was inflation hit a 13-year high in September with consumer prices up 5.4% compared with a year ago. So for people who are feeling worried about inflation, are there any changes that they should make either in their spending habits or in their saving habits and investing habits? Well, yeah, you know, definitely inflation is um, a big problem. And most people kind of don't understand what that means exactly. But it means that, you know, your dollars don't go as far as it, it, it might have gone before inflation went up. And so right now, you know, one of the things you can do is take a look at your budget. And I know people are thinking, OK, I've heard this, you know, ad nauseum. But uh, my experience when I work with people in their budgets is there's still a lot of room for cutting. And so when thing when prices are going up, you need to look at your budget and see where you can cut, where you might be able to make substitutions. So for example, maybe you were like, you know, brand loyal, I've got to have this certain kind of brand, but it's now really expensive. So perhaps look at the store brand. Um, you know, one of the things you might think uh, you might do is put off major purchases that aren't necessary until the price is stabilized. So maybe you were thinking about doing something, adding to a deck or doing something in your home that's not a necessary you know, it's not necessary, um, but, you know, it's hard to get materials. It's hard to get people to even come. And so, you know, when there is a high demand, then prices go up. So you might want to pull back. So these are like just minimal things that you can do to address this issue that prices are going up. You know what I'm curious about? How inflation should affect how people invest for retirement? Uh, yeah. because we had Paul Krugman on the show last week, and he's seeing, as a Nobel Prize-winning economist and you know New York Times columnist, he's seeing w- signs that the inflation is going to be transitory. This isn't going to be like the right. 1970s, that this is a pandemic-specific bubble of inflation and that it's probably going to go back to the low inflation that we had before the pandemic. But we don't know that. So if you're an investor trying to keep your eye on the long term, how do you take this into account? Well, the first thing you have to do is like, you you can't time the market. So you can't say, well, I'm going to invest this way because inflation is up or it's going to go down. And so you need an overall plan, right? And so, so my, my husband and I, for example, we've had our investments in our retirement, we have investments for our kids' college fund, and we have non-retirement investing. And we decided how aggressive we want to be as investors. Do we want more stocks, some bonds, a mix, you know, and then we set a plan. And then no matter what happens in the economy, we just let it ride because we've got time for all of those pots. Um, so, you know, but you could say, listen, I can't take all 
all this, this stress of risk. So then you'd put it in something that's less risky. But overall, your investment plan needs to be a plan that could weather all kinds of things in the economy. And obviously, if things are happening and you might want to adjust it as you, for example, get closer to retirement. So maybe, you know, up until 10 years ago, you know, 10 years to uh, retirement, you're thinking, I've been really, really aggressive, but now I'm going to really need this money. So I might pull back some. And so the invest, the um, uh, investment experts that I've talked to said, just have a plan, stick to it. And that overall time based on how the market has performed historically will do you well. Carl in Manhattan, you're on WNYC with Michelle Singletary. Hi, Carl. Oh, Carl's line dropped out just as I was going to him. So let's try Emily in Flatbush. Emily, you're on WNYC. Hi there. Hi. Um, I'm just calling because I'm a, a freelancer in film, and I actually create budgets for a living. But my um, personal budget, month to month, how much money I'm going to make varies widely. So I just love advice on how to personally budget when you don't even know what kind of money you're going to make next month. Right. That's such a great question, Emily. And so lots of times when people have irregular income, they think there's something special they have to do. Really, you're, the key to your budgeting is discipline. And this is what I mean. So there are months, Emily, are you still there? I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Yeah, I'm so here. there are months. <laughs> yeah. So there's months when you like, the money is just flowing. You're like, yeah, it is a great month. And then there are months when they're not. So what you need to do is establish a baseline budget like what's the minimum it costs to run my household like when I you know months when there's money's just not coming in what's minimum so you'd be like your rent or your mortgage utilities if you got a car payment insurance and just and cutting out all the extras what's the baseline and then every month as you get in your money you only fund the baseline and all the extra goes into what I call a sweep account. So say you're getting in your contracts, you put all that money into the sweep account and then you transfer out what you need to run your household for that month into your regular household banking account. Because what happens, and Emily, correct me if I'm wrong, in the good months, you, you feel a little bit more flushed and you might, you know, eat out more, do some more things because it's a good month. So you have to treat every month like it's your baseline budget month, no matter what you're earning. And that will even out the ups and downs of the months where you have good contracts and months when you don't. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess so. I think I just lean into credit cards more and then just know I'm going to get a lot more money down the line that I can pay back. But I know that's probably the, that's the wrong way to do it. <laughs> yeah, let's not do that. And I know it's really hard. So that means like I would suggest for the next couple of months, you live like you not no matter what is coming in, if, if it, even if it's good months, just live bare bones and try not to use the credit cards. And that, you know, and that could cause a major life difference differences in how you live, but you've got to create a baseline for yourself so that you're not, you know, using those credit cards in months while you're waiting for that next contract. Because here's what also could happen, and I know you know this, that people say they're going to pay you when they pay you, and it's the delay, and now you've got to use the credit cards even more while you wait for that check to come in. We want to try to wean you off of using that credit to bridge those gaps. We want the good months to bridge the gaps when you're not making as much. Emily, I hope that's helpful. Thanks for calling in. We're taking some personal financial advice questions for Michelle Singletary, Washington Post, personal finance advice columnist who comes on with us from time to time. Terry in Jersey City. You're on WNYC with Michelle Singletary. It's Terry and Singletary. Hi, Terry. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks. Thanks, Brian. And uh, yeah, uh, speaking of uh, finances, Brian Lair is invaluable. So um, let me just say that nice. uh, I have I have actually received a windfall of somewhere around a hundred thousand dollars, and uh, other than that and a home, I don't have pretty much anything. And so uh, I wanted to know what's the best way to go about. Um, I don't plan on spending any of it. I'm just gonna I'm gonna put it all away, and. Um, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is take six months of salary and put that aside, like for or like an emergency fund. But after yeah. that, I don't I don't know what to do. Should I like get a a 
planner or should I just go look at mutual funds or how, what's the best way to kind of approach that lump sum? Yeah, well, first of all, I'm so glad you're, t- you're pausing before you do anything with that. And you said you don't have any other debts, right, other than your mortgage. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's about right. it. Well, yeah, that's it. I have a car payment, too. Sorry, that's a debt. Okay, yeah, that is a debt. <laughs> and how much is the car payment? Uh, how much do, you, how about, much do you have left on the car that you owe? The entire thing, about yeah. Uh, $16,000. Yeah, so why don't you pay that off? I, yeah, I, I mean, I could. I, um, I, can't, I guess you're right. Yeah, I'm giving them the money anyway at some point. Right. Um, yeah. Is there a way that I can? Is, you know, uh, is there a way that I can do that to reduce the percentage that I'm paying in terms of the money that I borrowed to get from? Because it's through yeah, well, the the. Yeah. Yeah. Why pay? Listen, you got a windfall. You sound like you're doing great. You don't have any other debt except for your mortgage in the car that we found out. You know, why just get, you're just giving somebody money because you just want to give it to them. You've got the money. It's extra. You weren't expecting it. I, su- I suspect by just what you said that you're on track for saving for retirement, right? Um, I don't know about that. <laughs> okay. All right. So now we're getting a little deeper. See how you have to ask a whole bunch of questions to get to the deeper. So I would say, why don't you create a master financial plan for yourself? Look at how you're, if you're on track for retirement. And one of the things you could do, um, do you have a workplace retirement account? Um, yes, but uh, I'm self-employed, so... Oh, okay. Um, so, I, so yeah. you could maybe boost what you're putting into your your employment, your retirement account for your business. Like maybe you could put, you know, tech, you know, by what you earn, a, a cost is based on what you earn. Maybe it says your last tax said you sh- you could put in twenty, but you only put in ten. And so now you could put in that extra money. Um, list all your debts. So now we know we've got two debts. So you know why don't you pay off the car and all that money, those payments that you were making? Now you can put that and build back up your or build your right. savings account. So right. those are the, so look get a master plan before you decide what to do with the money. And we already talked about some things you could do, like pay off the car. Let me. Uh... Say goodbye to Terry because we're going to get one more person on here before we run out of time. Terry, thank you. I hope hope that was helpful. But let me follow up on one of the things you told Terry that I'll bet has a lot of people wondering. When you said take $16,000 of that $100,000 windfall that he came into and mm-hmm. totally pay off uh, your car payments, um, what's the principle there? Why is it better to do that? and chip away so much at your $100,000 windfall rather than put that that money toward long-term retirement investing. Well, you know, it's a it's a philosophy of life. And I, I just, I hate debt, right? You know, I've been on the show so much. Um, if debt was a person, I'd slap it. And mm-hmm. so I want him to free up the cash in his, um, his budget and then pay off the debt. And then all that money he would have given that he can still put in the market. It's not a zero sum game. He still had mm-hmm. that money. Now mm-hmm. he's now he doesn't have the debt and he can put it in the market. And the other thing is the market is no guarantee. It's been doing really well, you know, this past year, even during the pandemic, but you don't know, we don't know, but that's a guarantee return by paying off that car note. Um, and then he can still have that other money to put into the market. You know, right. lots of times people, and, and here's what else, human behavior comes into play because I would tell them that I don't hold the money, but oftentimes people don't end up putting the money in the market. They don't end up doing those things. On paper, it might make sense, but in practice, people don't actually do it. One more question. Daniel in Brooklyn, we're going to have to do this as about a 30-second question and a 30-second answer, but I think we can do it. Daniel, you're on with Michelle Singletary. Hi. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Brian. Um, thank you for taking my call. I was wondering, for a lot of us younger people who want to get into you know, investment in the stock market, um, I feel like especially in this day and age, it's so important to invest your money uh, you know, like in some things that don't actually end up working against you, like climate change or just industries that are kind of predatory towards consumers. So what would be your advice for younger people who want to get involved in the stock market but don't want to feel like they're selling their soul in a way? 
I love that. I love that so many of the investment companies have socially conscious investment funds where you can look at it. And for example, they, they might not have, they, they're not investing in tobacco or other things that you're against. So just contact, you know, your current investment company. If you're investing, if you've got a workplace plan, you can contact that investment company and ask them about their socially conscious funds so that you can put your money where your values are. And we leave it there for today with Michelle Singletary, personal finance columnist for the Washington Post and author of the new book, What to Do with Your Money When Crisis Hits. As always, Michelle, thanks for coming on with us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me.